Good afternoon, and welcome to today's talk, Developing Human-Centered Data Science to Mitigate Algorithmic Biases. My name is Claudia Hughes, and I'm the Associate Director of Advancement at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Information. We are delighted to present today's talk as part of the university's alumni reunion festivities and showcase one of the exciting areas of work happening here at the faculty. Along the bottom edge of your screen, you should see an icon to open the Q&A window. We welcome you to use this feature to submit questions or to vote for other attendees' questions throughout the event. We have reserved time towards the end of the event to respond in a live Q&A. And now, without further ado, it is with pleasure that I hand it over to Dean Wendy Duff to acknowledge the land and introduce our featured presenter. Thank you very much, Claudia, and I'd like to welcome you all. But before I do, I would like to wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates and where I'm sitting right now. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississauga of the credit. Today, it is a meeting place. This, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. It is also my great pleasure to introduce Cheyenne Gua. The great thing about introducing Professor Cheyenne Gua is I get to say that he literally wrote the book and you're going to be hearing a little bit about it on human-centered data science. He is a pioneer in this new and important field and the perfect person to talk to you about the kinds of work researchers in human-centered science is doing or are doing. Professor Gua joined the Faculty of Information just last year, I guess, in 2021 to help us develop our new concentration in human-centered data science, which was introduced in 2019. Next month, we will see our first second, our second class of human-centered data science students graduate, and the concentration continues to grow in popularity thanks to faculty members like Professor Gua and the fascinating work that they're doing. His current research focuses on the challenges of using algorithm decision-making and public policy and how to make better data-driven systems by incorporating human-centered design. In his talk, Professor Gua will give you insights into the use of algorithms in child welfare and criminal justice systems and what can be done to mitigate their biases and make these systems more human-centered. So without further ado, because I know that you're in for a delightful and insightful talk, uh, and which I myself am looking forward to. So I'm going to hand it over and I'm going to mute. Thank you very much, Wendy, for that great introduction. Let me share my uh, slides. So hopefully everyone can see my slides. Um, okay. All right, there we go. So I want to talk about human-centered data science and more specifically, I want to talk about the relationship between this new field of human-centered data science and the Faculty of Information. Why is Faculty of Information the best place to be doing human-centered data science work? And so through this talk, I hope that I can convince you not just what human-centered data science is, but the relationships between the traditional strengths of the Faculty of Information with our novel uh, directions that we're going in the future. So in order to get started with all of this, uh, I would like to present some motivations about this work. I want to tell you about why human-centered data science is useful, important, and very necessary in today's world. So for instance, you know, uh, in the United States, for instance, uh, there are many jurisdictions across the country where uh, algorithms and artificial intelligence is used to make decisions about criminal justice. So for instance, bail setting, how much bail would a person uh, be, uh, be set? Uh, or for instance, sentencing, how many years of prison should a person have? Uh, believe it or not, these are all uh, mostly used with some kind of a quantitative, predictive decision-making tool. And as you can see in this particular screenshot, that a lot of them uh, kind of overpredict certain demographics, usually minorities, and underpredict other demographics. So clearly, it's not really working out very well. 
Moving to a slightly different domain, uh, this is a screenshot from the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, uh, where they recently did an expose partially based off of uh, the work that my research group has done in the past around how algorithms are often used in the child welfare system and how uh, algorithms instead of uh, perpetuating positive outcomes actually result in family surveillance by the government and a lot of oppression in a variety of different ways. And if this doesn't convince you, then, you know, just look at this uh, New York Times uh, article about how, um, you know, San Francisco, which is one of the most, quote unquote, politically progressive areas in the United States once tried to use algorithms to make decisions about what child is going to what kind of a school. And since it's very well known that what schools you initially go to often influence the career path that you might go under, uh, it actually resulted in a lot of school segregation uh, with a lot of overrepresentation and underrepresentation of demographic minorities, and it's all horrible. So you can see here in three different critical domains in today's world, criminal justice, child welfare, education, that algorithms are used and they often don't work out very well. So now you could ask me the question, well, all of this is you know, in the United States of America. Well, surely Canada is, is a lot better. Well, that might surprise you. For instance, the Canadian federal government uses algorithms to make decisions about um, what kinds of refugees we might want to have. Uh, for instance, you know, thinking about the current uh, state of affairs, there's been a lot of critical media commentaries about how Ukrainian refugees are being treated vis-a-vis, -vis, for instance, let's say, Syrian or Afghan refugees back in 2014 through 2016. And there's a lot of these different kinds of tools that are often used by the government to try and make these decisions here in Canada. If that doesn't convince you, then for instance, you can think about how AI is often used in the Canadian criminal justice system. Uh, just as lots of jurisdictions in the United States use algorithms to make decisions in criminal justice, so does Canada. And finally, if that also doesn't uh, convince you, then the Ontario Human Rights Commission a couple of years ago wrote a very scathing report about uh, uh, algorithms that are often used in the Ontario child welfare system that results in a lot of overrepresentation, a hugely overrepresentation of Indigenous and Black children than, than really what statistics might suggest. So clearly there's a lot of these various different venues in today's world where algorithms are being used, they're often used by the government and they often result in things going wrong. So who builds these algorithms, right? I mean, oftentimes the government doesn't have the competency to build the algorithms. Uh, the government outsources the contracting of the development of these kinds of systems to third parties, private companies. It happens very frequently in North America, certainly in Canada. So then the question that arises is, okay, well, this is bad. Uh, and, and clearly this is very related with the current hype of AI systems that currently exists. In fact, the current federal government administration ever since it came into power has made AI, artificial intelligence, data science, and machine learning a cornerstone for Canadian science and technology policy development. It says that Canada should become a leader in these kinds of fields. But of course, if you look at these screenshots, it doesn't really tell us or give us the impression that we're a leader in any of these fields. So then the question arises is, well, what can we do? How can we make things better? On one hand, we could critique, and of course, good people have critiqued these systems, but surely these systems are not going away. Surely the government is not going to be in a position where it says, we shall never use algorithms ever again. I mean, that cat is out of the bag. So the question is, okay, what do we do now? And what we do now is we think about how can we make things better? That's a slow process. It's an incremental process. It's completely against the current Silicon Valley inspired ethos of move fast and break things. And that's what human centered data science is. We do not move fast and we try not to break things. So then 
let's think about human-centered data science. Let's, let's think about some principles, but what is this field? I just kind of cobbled together a few words, but what are we really trying to do with this field? In human-centered data science, we're really trying to develop algorithms that empower stakeholders. And stakeholders are not just the government. In fact, the most important stakeholders are the people who are often being oppressed by these kinds of systems. Supporting decision-making processes. Improving the quality of the engagement that bureaucrats often have with common people off the streets who are here to seek help and services from the government. And finally, and most importantly, from a researchy education point of view, how do we meld together computational and interpretive methodologies in order to look at a problem, understand a problem holistically? In short, how do we change how data science is done currently and, and kind of move it in a more human-centered world? And in order to convince you that this is very, that it's very useful, uh, I'm going to present a case study about child welfare, about algorithms in child welfare. And I hope that I can convince you through that process. But first, uh, let me point you towards what Wendy talked about. This is um, a book that a, a textbook that a few colleagues and I wrote uh, and was published earlier this year. This is not a research monograph. It's a very applied, practical textbook that is geared towards the kinds of students that we have in the Faculty of Information, professional master's students uh, who are willing to do human-centered data science in useful and interesting ways. So in this book, we kind of lay out the human-centered data science research and development framework. So what does that framework look like? This is a facsimile of what that framework is, it's a little bit more detailed, but if we take a step back and we abstract what the human-centered research process could be, this is what it is. First of all, in order to really engage with the system, we have to understand the socio-technical system first. A lot of the issues that I kind of pointed out of in criminal justice or child welfare or immigration and refugee services is because the people who are building the models are not the people who engage with the system or understand the nuances of that system in useful and interesting ways. See, what happens is one of the reasons why these models don't work very well in practice is because the models reflect the design and value choices of their designers as opposed to the people that they should be serving. So the first process that anyone ought to be doing is to understand what the socio-technical system actually is. And then secondly, we apply human-centered design processes in this algorithm design process, which is a pretty novel thing. And it's, it's a little um, kind of off-center in how students are taught about algorithm design uh, in, you know, when they first take a class in algorithm design, this is not what they're taught. And really, human-centered design uh, centers people, as the name suggests, and there's a variety of different ways in which human-centered design is often carried out. Um, here we, you know, I just put three different lenses of thinking about human-centered design. There are many others. You could think about theoretical designs, where we kind of design two specific theories that are already very well known about how people work with the system. Or we could think about participatory design. How about we ask different stakeholders, including the people whose data are being analyzed, to help in design of these models? What would that world look like? And we also talk about speculative design, which is also thinking about completely out of the box, counterfactual approaches. What might have we done in this speculative world that might have resulted in positive outcomes down the line? And so once we've understood the socio-technical system and we've kind of thought about human-centered design in a few ways, we can then go forward and incorporate these learnings into traditional AI, machine learning, data science, models, algorithms, call it what you will. And then the process doesn't end there. There's one of the most important things which people don't really do for a variety of reasons are longitudinal field evaluations. It's not enough to 
train a model um, in, in the lab or, or in the office and then just deploy it, you need to have long-term field evaluations before you implement any kind of system into place. Now, a lot of this might seem aspirational and it might seem like, oh, we all do this. But unfortunately, that's not what the reality is. Uh, it's been very, very well studied that uh, whether it be in government, nonprofit, or uh, industry, uh, people don't really develop uh, data science models through this kind of a perspective. They might aspire to it, but they don't do it. And so the process, so the idea is how do we train our students in the Faculty of Information to do this? And so we obviously have a well-defined curriculum where we're trying to do all of this, but let me try and kind of contextualize this particular framework, and we'll come back to this framework, and we'll fill in the blanks um, through this case study that I'm about to show you. So the case study that I want to talk about is this idea about algorithms and child welfare systems. And for some of you who might not be aware of this, it might be you might be completely aghast to hear that we use algorithms to make decisions about the most vulnerable children in our society, but that's where, what our world has come down to. So various fine researchers have studied these kinds of systems and, you know, government has also studied their own systems and have come up with all of these white papers about how we should be doing all of these decision making in child welfare. And unfortunately, uh, we've seen that uh, a lot of the cases, it doesn't really work out well. And the government thinks it works out well, but on closer scrutiny, it actually doesn't work out very well. This is a very well publicized uh, story from uh, Allegheny County in Pittsburgh uh, in the United States that, you know, uh, has been uh, uh, the, the root of many news stories that have been written in the past few years. Um, especially uh, uh, there's a book called Automating Inequality by the author Virginia Eubanks, who wrote a lot about this. But unfortunately, they're often gaslit by the government and the government insists that, oh no, all of you mean researchers should not be writing mean things about what the government is doing. So this is a case study from Pittsburgh. And previously I showed how these kinds of problems also exist in Canada. And now I will talk about the work that I've done with my collaborators in a completely different setting in Wisconsin. And so hopefully through these same problems that come up again and again, through algorithms, through AI models in the same space, you will be convinced that we need human-centered data science. So, Going forward, here are three broad research questions that I, my collaborators and I sought to answer. And we'll fill in the blanks and we'll go back to that human-centered data science uh, research framework diagram that I showed in order to convince you that, you know, this is what we should be doing. So the first question, in order to understand the socio-technical system, we need to understand what the current state of algorithms are in the US child welfare system. Now, for research, obviously we focused on the US because it was the most documented. I have a very similar paper that I'm working on right now with my students, which centers on Canada. And believe you me, there are very similar problems that uh, come up again and again. Now, I'm gonna abstract a lot of these things and I'll kind of try to hit, you know, highlight the greatest hits. But essentially, you know, if you, this math looks scary, don't worry, this is what a basic model looks like. Uh, there's some kind of an output that we're always trying to predict. There's some kinds of data inputs that we're trying to give. And obviously the whole thing taken together is a method uh, or what we might call a model nowadays. Now, based on the work that I did with my colleagues, we showed, and the specific details I can talk about it later if people are interested, but you know, we found that there are biases in outputs. So what kinds of outputs and outcomes and predictions are actually developed in models? We discovered that there's lots of biases in inputs. So what kinds of data are actually used to develop these models? And of course, we discovered that there are biases in the choice of the model itself. Now, this 
was kind of a little bit of a revelation in the research community because until now, a huge focus of biases in algorithms had focused on data. So everyone was talking about, oh no, we have bad data and bad data results in bad outputs. Unfortunately, what we showed is that not only is it a function of bad data, but it's also a function about biased choices of models. Because if you go back to what I previously said, models are dependent on the design choices of their creators. So those are also biased. And of course, going back to the outputs, the choice of what outputs you choose to predict are also biased. So each of these three main parts of any kind of a model, any kind of a system are biased. There's no two ways about it. We've shown this very, very well. So of course, there's a bunch of these you know, main outcomes that we showed and we were like, okay, look, what's really happening is not only is everything biased, but the data that governments are collecting about children are extremely biased. For instance, I will give you one specific data question that most governments ask of children or of their parents in order to make a decision about whether or not to take the child away from their biological parents. The question is, and a caseworker goes to the family's house and opens up the fridge and looks at whether there's any nutritious food that's in the fridge and the caseworker makes a tick, you know, is there nutritious food available? Yes, no. The question is, what does it mean to have nutritious food? And what if you live in food deserts where there's no nutritious food that's available as defined by the government? Then the government automatically tells you that you are a bad parent because you do not have nutritious food, but the choice might not be up to you. You might be suffering from structural inequalities that result in lack of access to nutritious food, but then that data source is used against you in an algorithm. So this is the kind of things that happen. It's one question, one kind of a question that's asked. And these kinds of quantitative questions are not very useful. But why are they used? They're used, if you look at the second bullet point over here, they're used because they're readily available. Data that is easily quantifiable is used, but the data that's easily quantifiable might not be the right kind of data. And that's one of the largest problems in this kind of area. And it goes beyond child welfare, it goes into criminal justice, goes into education, goes into unemployment services, welfare, so on and so forth. So then, based off of this study, we worked with the American Civil Liberties Union, and we kind of you know, launched this nationwide campaign about, all right, we should not really be doing this but the question that arises is, are there better ways of doing it? So in order to think about better ways, which you know, I'm trying to convince you why human-centered data science is the better way, we need to be thinking about the system itself, like what happens. And that brings us to the second question. Well, how are algorithms actually embedded in the system? The first question was, let's try to understand what the algorithms do. And the second question is, how are these algorithms used? They're two separate questions. And so we did a detailed qualitative study uh, comprising of an ethnography and a whole bunch of semi-structured depth interviews uh, with the Child Welfare Agency who are our collaborators in Wisconsin. And, um, you know, we realized that what the system really looks like is something like this. And, and this might be a huge, you know, a lot of information that's being thrown at you, but don't worry about the specifics. I just want you to think about how complicated the child welfare system actually is. And in this figure, the, the text with the red outlines are the spots where algorithms are actually embedded and used. So it's not just a simple question of, should I be, you know, removing a child from their parents' place or not? But they're used in a multitude of different contexts for which they were never, never designed for anyway. And the child welfare system also has a lot of intersection with the legal system, which is all of the blue boxes that you can see. And the legal system has their own sets of norms, values, and concerns that often intersects with and is often at odds with, has tensions with what caseworkers are trying to do in child welfare. So 
The system as it is set up right now is set up to fail regardless of what kinds of algorithms you might want to implement. Like it's, it's, it's a complete mess. And it's a mess primarily because a structural inequalities that are present, lack of funding is the second point. And the third point is you can't solve structural problems with algorithms. Structural problems exist by default. You can only kind of plaster over them or paper over them with algorithms. It doesn't really work very well. So we thought about, okay, if this is what the current state of the world is, why do we want to build any kind of predictive algorithm? Why must an AI algorithm do predictions is a question that we asked. And when I went to other better people than I and asked them this same question, they couldn't answer it because for some reason, the default in data science is that we must always do predictions. But no one ever said that we must always do predictions in data science. That is just some default norm that we seem to have. Surely you can build models that do not predict, but do other useful things. And so with that mentality, and that kind of came out of this deep theoretical study that we did in this particular system. And all of this is to just show you all of the various places where the algorithms are used. And I also wanted to highlight what a specific team looks like. It's not one person making a decision. It's a whole bunch of people making a decision about a child, each of them with different power, different educational and professional credentials and different kinds of relationships and job responsibilities. And together they do collaborative algorithmic decision-making. And therein lies another problem. All of these algorithms that have been built that all of the ones that, are, that I mentioned with the new snapshots that have failed, all of those venues have collaborative algorithmic decision-making, but all of our algorithms, the outputs that they give you are not set up for collaborative algorithmic decision-making. It kind of assumes that one person will make a decision and that's completely unrealistic. One person does not actually make a decision. So from this particular question that we asked, why must we always have predictions? We realized a few things that, you know, I've kind of mentioned before, the current quantitative predictors outcomes methods are inappropriate. Data is biased and indeed, you know, if you ask me, I can tell you, but the caseworkers who work in the system as well as the foster parents, they know that the data is biased and the data, biased data is used for algorithms. So they've figured out how to game the system. And it's a fascinating case study of how people can realize when, to co-opt an algorithm and make sure that the bad outputs work for them. So the next question then, I'm gonna skip over this a little bit because it's a little theoretical, but we came up with this theoretical framework and we realized that there are these three big decision-making criteria about algorithms, especially if you want to be doing collaborative decision right? There's the idea of human discretion, there's the idea of current bureau bureaucratic processes and laws, and then there's the idea of algorithmic literacy. How, does, how do people actually understand what an output is? If someone gives you a probability, how do you interpret that? If someone gives you something that says high, medium, low risk, how do you interpret that? And so we then wanted to ask the question, okay, We've understood what the system is, which was the first step of data, human centered data science. We've then asked the question about theory. How do these algorithms kind of are embedded? Is there a theoretical framework for understanding how algorithms are embedded? And then we asked the follow up question why must we live in a predictive world? Could we not live in a data science world that's not predictive in nature? And that's the question we wanted to ask in this particular third part of, and last part of our case study, which is how can human-centered data science help? Like, how do we actually do data science? Right now we've studied everything, what do we do? And so in order to ask the question, we said, you know what? Our previous studies have pointed out that all of the quantitative data that's used in child welfare, that's really bad and biased. And then when we kind of dug down deeper, we realized that that structured data only represents about 15% of the overall data that's in child welfare. And really, those are the worst parts of child welfare data. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of narrative, textual, 
qualitative, almost ethnographic data that's stored in child welfare systems that the governments mandate that you must store in child welfare systems that are in all of these databases that are archived in all of these locations that no one has any kind of an idea where they exist, how they exist, are they even useful? But they're really the bulk of the data that exists. So what's happening with data science or traditional non-human centered data science in child welfare is that they're based only on 15% of the data that's low quality and biased. So then the question that naturally arises is, how do we make sense of these narrative data that's often stored in these digital archives that we have absolutely no idea how to look at, who looks at them, they're not even indexed in any useful way. So we decided to do a study to kind of really think about, well, could we, could we analyze this data? Could we even dare to think about what that might mean? And so we got a little data set from our child welfare agency and you know, I'll skip over the numbers a little bit. That's not the important part of this. But we did a bunch of, you know, we did a we did something called topic modeling, which is essentially we went through the text in order to uncover what kinds of latent hidden themes and topics might exist and what if those might give us some useful ideas. And we at the end of the day, we came up with six distinct latent teams that might be useful in thinking about child welfare for this particular data set. Specifically, we realized that four out of these six teams, we already knew because we'd done a deep ethnography. So we already knew that we'd done this. Then we got very surprised because we realized that there are two teams, which are the ones in the red boxes, that we didn't even know, and that could not have been uncovered by our ethnography. So this then started giving us some ideas. Wait, are you telling me that there's actual interesting ideas about the work that is done in child welfare that's invisible and that is not directly observable, but that kind of exists in these digital archives? Okay. So in making the step, we decided that, okay, let's, let's drill down deeper into this. Let's then, I'll, again, I'll abstract over this. I, I don't, you know, you don't need to know any of the math, but regardless, what we really wanted to find, we had a bunch of fancy analysis, and we wanted to see if these kinds of textual narratives can be useful in helping caseworkers and foster parents make decisions about the kids in a better way that's not a predictive way. So we moved on from this predictive, deficit-based, scarcity mindset-based data science modeling that currently exists, and we shifted the narrative towards what we call strength-based understandings, or instead of reducing a child's fate and fortune down to a single number, can we instead nudge caseworkers and foster parents to make better decisions based off of other better decisions that have worked well in the past? So that's really the shift. And we could not have done this shift if we hadn't done all of that initial backdrop work that you know, I just talked about. So, you know, in going forward, you know, you can see that we realized, for instance, in this particular example, that there's all of these like parenting classes that caseworkers need to take biological parents to, and foster parents need to observe uh, how biological parents are engaging in these parenting classes that are mandated by the government, dot, 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 right? So how do you incentivize them to make sure they're completing the uh, parenting classes? Otherwise, they'll never uh, be reunited with their kids, for instance, or assessments or home safety. Can we move away from asking individual questions about is there nutritious food in your fridge and more towards other kinds of understanding, right? And so after we did all of this, we then started to think about, okay, well, surely there must be some understanding about day-to-day -day power relationships, not structural power, day-to-day -day power. So how could how could we help the right person make the right decision? And it turns out, based on 
who the child is and what kind of case we're thinking about. There are different kinds of people who exercise the most power and authority in a day-to-day -day setting. Again, this is not structural power. This is daily power. And those are the people who actually need to be nudged. So the popular narrative in child welfare is that caseworkers have all of the power. But that's actually not true because here you can see that the biological parent actually has power for a particular kind of a child which is child welfare cases, which are about neglect, not abuse. Neglect cases are about 95% of all child welfare cases. And these are cases where uh, they do what is called at-home placement. So they're not taken away from the parents. But for other kinds of parents, you know, you can see that the foster parents have the most kinds of authority, especially for children who have been removed from their parents and who are in like short-term or even long-term foster care. So these power relationships are important because you can't be telling, nudging people to make good decisions um, unless they're the right decisions or also the right people. So I'm identifying A, the right strategy and the right decision and B, the right people are extremely important. So based off of this study, we highlighted that actual analysis of these narratives that are stored in these digital archives are actually very helpful in highlighting these invisible patterns of work, labor, and events, and power relationships that we can then use to nudge the right kinds of people in the right kinds of cases to make better decisions about the children. So taken together, taken together, a lot more needs to be done. Right, But if I kind of abstract all of that and go back to the diagram that you know we started out as, right? Here I've started filling in the blanks. And you can see in the blue box, it was that first study that we did where we tried to understand algorithms that we kind of filled in the blanks. And then in the orange box, we talked about that second study where we really tried to understand the theoretical embeddedness of algorithms. And then, Slowly, we're starting to fill in the blanks. You know, we did we did uh, uh, the, the, this work with the computational narrative an analysis that I just talked about, where we're slowly filling in all of these blanks and we're trying to understand and really make better decisions in child welfare. So this is not a one shot. Let's build a model, deploy the model, and then and then forget, which is kind of what it is right now. It's real embeddedness participatory co-designing with a variety of stakeholders to really understand how do we do all of this. So family of information is really set up to do this kind of work because this kind of work that combines computational technical competencies with critical interpretive methodologies working with a variety of stakeholders with marginalized populations, this is really the kind of pluralistic core of the kinds of stuff that were well known here in Faculty of Information. So hopefully I've been able to convince you that human-centered data science is a useful direction for the Faculty of Information to grow in. I wanted to present a few highlights about our concentration, about what we've been doing. Uh, so as Wendy pointed out earlier, 2019-20, uh, our HCDS concentration within the MI program was first launched. Uh, last year, we, we had our first, you know, few graduates. Um, we'll have our second cohort this year. Um, this year, we've seen burgeoning growth of our human-centered data science applicants. Um, almost 19% of our applicants this year, this 2022 cycle, uh, have mentioned human-centered data science as what they might want to be doing, uh, which is the second highest after our user experience and design concentration, which is also very popular. And this growth in HCDS has just happened in two years, which is just uh, amazing. But it's a little bit more nuanced than that. I, I, want, to, I want to talk to you a little bit more uh, about this, which is, you know, we're also doing research, we're getting PhD students, but increasingly, as a faculty member who teaches in the HCDS score, I'm starting to see a lot of students who are interested in combining concentrations in archives with HCDS, LIS with HCDS. And that's giving me a lot of you know, uh, great hope because as, as this research that I just talked about kind of really highlighted, 
without some of our domain competencies in thinking about archives, in thinking about critiquing classification systems, which librarians were some of the first people to actually critique classification systems, this would really not have been possible. So I'm seeing a lot of very interest in, 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 in our students who want to do these kinds of intersectional work. And, uh, and so really, if I had to kind of summarize what HCDS at the Faculty of Information is, it's really a combination of our traditional strengths with these new computational competencies that we are developing. So hopefully through all of this, I've been able to convince you that we have a great program that's going on here. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm crediting my uh, funders as well as my collaborators, grants, uh, so on and so forth. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Before we hand it over, um, Cheyenne, I just want to thank you for such a fantastic talk. And, and you know, again, as, as a person who came to the faculty to teach archives when it was brand new, about a quarter of a century ago, I do believe that you can't have data science without archives, because that's where a lot of the data comes from, as well as libraries. So, uh, but I think that, Claudia, are you going to help handle any questions that, that our uh, people have? Yes, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you, Cheyenne, for that insightful discussion. And um, I found it very interesting, um, just that study in the child welfare system. And um, sad to hear that there are those same inequalities, of course, here in Canada. But this gives me hope, you know, when there are people working on questions like this, um, there's hope for the future, I think. So I just want to remind all of our attendees today that we do have the option at the bottom of your screen to submit some questions for Cheyenne to answer. Simply click the Q&A window and you can view other attendees' questions, which you can then choose to upvote or submit some of your own. So um, let's just jump right in. Oh, yes, Wendy? Well, yeah, I thought maybe just so people could start forming their questions that I would maybe ask the first question of Cheyenne. And, You're welcome and to ask a question, Wendy. <laughs> Thanks. I was just thinking, Cheyenne, about, and, and maybe this is not a fair question, and maybe you don't have the answer or, or have thought about this, but, you know, you talked a little bit about how this is such a great place for data science because, again, classification and data and all of the things that so many of our you know, our alum studied and our predecessors, uh, scholars studied. But I wonder how, do you have any sense about how data science is different when it's taught in an iSchool compared to the way it is taught? Like we have data science in, there's an applied program at U of T within stats and computer science. There's a data science program in engineering. There's a data science program in medicine. There's a data science program in, in Man management, and that's just at the University of Toronto. So I wonder whether you have a sense of both how being within the iSchool, how that changes data science and how data science changes perhaps the iSchool. Absolutely, that's a great question. And I think I am a very good person to answer that question because I have flip-flopped from one data science program to the other in the course of my professional career. So I'll, I'll summarize for, for attendees here, but until my master's program, I was a theoretical statistician doing applied statistics when, you know, the name data science first began to be thrown around about, you know, almost 15 years ago at this point. I went from a statistics department to an high school where I did applied data science work and I worked in some of the earliest industry teams which were called data science teams. So IBM, data science user experience, Facebook, what is now Facebook for data science, et cetera. So I worked in all of those teams in like 2011, 12, et cetera, when data science first began kind of coming up. Then I went from an high school, my prior faculty position before this one was in a computer science department where we opened up a data science program in a CS department. And then in this particular job where of course we have a new data science program in an high school. So I've seen a lot of these different lenses from statistics, from computer science and in an high school. And I think that there's a variety of ways in which we can understand it, but just to abstract it for the attendees, I think that data science in an high school um, 
in, in any high school, even if it is not called human-centered data science, is a lot more closer to what this imagination of human-centered data science is. Um, if, for instance, there are people who really only care about the theoretical algorithmic underpinnings of data science, then a program in a computer science department or a statistics department is probably more useful. Alas, what is happening, well, not alas, but at grade yay, what is happening is that most companies and governments and nonprofits have now realized that just training students with technical insights is not enough. And, you know, in the early days of departments realizing that, oh, no, we must do ethics in data science, that strategy is also not enough. So what CS departments earlier did, and I know this because we did this in my prior CS program, is we added an ethics class. So we added an ethics class and we said, yes, students, go take that ethics class and now you're all ethical data scientists. That is also not enough because then people kind of treat that ethics program uh, class as just like, oh, this is the requirement I need to take. And now what iSchools are doing is we are realizing that you can't just have like separate classes like that because that kind of just others what students want to learn and in fact human centeredness ethics and appreciation for positive outcomes doing things slowly and methodically and deeply is something that must exist from the very beginning in fact an introduction to programming class for data science in an high school is markedly different from an introduction to programming for data science in a CS department, uh, because we value different things. At the end of the day, you're still learning uh, the, the basic technical competencies that you need to know in order to do the kind of data science programming that you need to do. But the lens of inquiry is very different. And obviously, as someone who's a strong believer in human-centered data science, um, I think that our approach is the best approach. And finally, just to kind of conclude that point, I want to say that my colleagues and I, us who've been thinking about human centered data science for since 2016, 2017 from now, it's not just University of Toronto, although we are the first and only school in Canada to do human centered data science, but some of the top high schools in the United States and in Europe have now adopted human centered data science as a, a serious scientific field of inquiry, as well as an educational program for students. So anyway, so I'll stop here. Uh, because we've got other questions, but yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for your question, Wendy, and thank you for answering that so thoroughly, Cheyenne. I'm just going to jump right into some of the questions that have received more votes. Uh, we have here from Beth. Her question is that the overrepresentation of Indigenous and Black persons in the criminal justice system has been in the media. From your work and experience, do you have any thoughts on how human centered data science might be applied to this important issue? Would the same issues you encountered working in the child welfare space apply? Yes, Beth, that is a that is a good question. I've actually done separate work in criminal justice. Uh, I have a whole different line of research on criminal justice in doing HCDS in criminal justice spaces. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the reason. So the human centered data science framework that we talked about is a very generalizable framework. You can this is basically a strategy that you should use to do data science in any space. Um, unfortunately, it, it doesn't appear as if there's a lot of work that's going on in criminal justice. There's a lot of, the problem is, there's a lot of money in, in criminal justice, especially in governments trying to use data to solve human uh, uh, criminal justice problems using data. And so what has happened is a lot of, uh, big tech or even small tech companies have now realized that oh we just want a slice of that pie so now you've got a lot of companies that are that are coming in saying oh we will solve all of your criminal justice problems for you but none of them and they're all doing it in this kind of half, half hazard fragmented ways but none of them are kind of doing it in this deep thoughtful space there is criminology research that's going on uh, in, in academia that's deep and thoughtful and really, really useful, but I haven't quite seen any applied work in criminal justice. I really hope that, you know, uh, different criminal justice uh, uh, jurisdictions or governments uh, can do deep projects in this space, but it doesn't seem as if they are. 
Uh, and would the same issues I encounter in child welfare space apply? Absolutely, because you know there's a deep relationship between child welfare and criminal justice in any country. So the kinds of nascent issues that you discover in child welfare would carry over to criminal justice in, in, in horrible ways. Thank you. And on to our next question, um, we have from an anonymous attendee. Could you give an example of designing for specific theories? It sounds intriguing, but I don't think I fully grasped the concept. Excellent. Yeah, I'll give you an example from the work that we just I just talked about. So, for instance, one of the things that we discovered uh, in terms of uh, theory is that there was no theory about how algorithmic decision making is done. There was no theory. So we actually developed the theory, which is the AdMaps framework that we talked about, that kind of looks at what the dimensions of algorithmic decision making actually are. How do groups of people make decisions about high stakes environments from algorithms? So there was no theory. We came up with the theory. And now that we know what the theory is, now that we understand how people actually use algorithmic outcomes to make decisions, we can develop more human-centered algorithms that help us uh, you know, kind of tailor the algorithm towards the theory, to nudge the people to do more of what they already do. For instance, there are other, other theories too. But... Thank you. Um, we have a question here from Tim Knight, uh, who also says, great presentation, by the way, thank you. Curious to know how the child welfare system has reacted to these findings. Have they been receptive to this move to human-centered data science? Uh, that's a good question. So I am very familiar with the child welfare system across the United States, which is very fragmented. Like 50 states have 50 different child welfare systems and each sub-jurisdiction has a different child welfare system. Um, largely speaking, the people within child welfare are very receptive to all of this they want to make the change. So I'm talking about your average worker who works in these agencies and departments. They want to make the change. But one of their biggest kind of um, drawbacks is that the heads of these agencies are often political appointees who are kind of beholden to the kind of political pressures that come down based on what that political pressure is. That's number one. Number two, in order to solve problems, it costs money. And uh, if there's anything that's underfunded, it's child welfare. In Canada and the United States, completely unfunded. So the average agency worker, the average department worker and their leadership want to make, a, like they're very positive, they're receptive to this. But, and in fact, a lot in a lot of the cases, they also don't want any kind of predictive algorithms. But often the decision is not up to them. If, for instance, the governor in a US state says, we must now have algorithms in child welfare. They don't have a choice. Thank you. And we have a question from Medina here. Thank you for the case study. Uh, this field has so much applicability in public, public service, clearly. Uh, but how many of your graduates do you actually see, um, or how many graduates actually see themselves working for the public sector? Do actually, you have any information yeah. on that? Uh, yes, absolutely. Here I can say that Canada is better than the, than the United States. So even in the first cohort of graduates that we have, and the second cohort that's about to go out, including some of my students, we have people who currently work for the government at both the federal and provincial level. So we have students who have been hired by Statistics Canada. We've been students who've been hired by Health Canada, Health Ontario, uh, uh, Natural Resources Canada, so on and so forth. You know, you know, I have a student who is doing an internship in immigration, uh, etc. So we actually have students who are very interested in going to the government to uh, kind of try to solve or address all of these issues. And it seems to me that Canadian governments, uh, both federal and provincial, are a lot more receptive, or maybe they just have a lot more agency to make some of these changes than what I might have seen in the US. So it's actually, yeah, we do have students who are very interested. That's great to hear. You know, definitely, and I've heard anecdotally stories of our alumni that have graduated and seek to work with NGOs and developmental agencies. So I can vouch for that. Oh, wonderful. I have another question here that was submitted through the chat. 
Um, can human-centered data science still have applications in predictive modeling? I know that you were talking about how <laughs> these models, people want to predict outcomes so much, but um, do you still see applications in that way with a more human-centered approach? Um, I have been advocating to move away from a risk-based, probability-based, deficit predictive based work. That is my big crusade. But better people than I could probably think of predictive worlds where you can do human centered data science in very, very useful ways. The issue is you have to be comfortable with a certain level of risk then. You have to be comfortable with a certain, like you have to accept the fact you can't solve everyone's problems. There's always going to be uh, exceptions, outliers that the, you know you can't predict the predict their positive outcomes. It just won't happen. If we're comfortable with that, then I think we can do predictions pretty well. I mean, better than what we're doing now. But as it is now, we're also. It seems that we now we don't care about what level of risk we're comfortable with. We're just doing things willy nilly. So uh, we have to be comfortable with that. And even in a non-algorithmic world, we still don't solve everyone's problems. So, you know, it's not like an either or, it's not a question of like either we have algorithms or, or we don't have algorithms. That, that genie is out of the bottle. Like, I do not think that, I think that unless our system of governance completely changes overnight and we move away from, you know, this system of government that we have, we're not going to live in a world where algorithms don't exist in a variety of critical domains. They're always going to exist. So then people are always going to do predictions. So then in that case, Either we move away from predictions towards other kinds of algorithmic outcomes, or we do better predictions. Thank you. And with that, we've come to the end of our questions and the end of our time for today. Um, sorry, that went by really quickly, but thank you so much, everyone, for submitting your questions, and thank you, Cheyenne, for answering them so thoroughly. Um, again, I want to thank you today for this presentation on a fascinating topic, and I do extend my thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Uh, we invite you to learn more about human-centered data science and the other innovative work at the Faculty of Information by following us on social media or reaching out to advancement.ischool at utoronto.ca. Thank you very much. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and a happy alumni reunion. Claudia, and before now. you sign off, um, if people, there was a recording, if um, Cheyenne's all right with sharing it and anyone wanted the copy of the recording to share, would that be okay, Cheyenne? Would you feel comfortable with that? Yeah? Yes, that yeah. sounds good. We'll do that. Yes, okay, so we'll great. make the recording available after the event. It, it was fabulous, Cheyenne. You know, every time you talk, I learn more. So I want to thank you also. And Claudia, thanks for organizing such a great event. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, everyone.